Hi everyone, thank you for coming this evening. I am just the introducer to the introducer, um, so I'm the opening act. Um, my name is Maniche, I'm the curator of the AA's public program, and I'm delighted to, int to introduce Shumi Bose, who will be chairing this evening's conversation. Um, it's going to be focusing on public practice, which is an initiative that um, Finn Williams and Pooja Agrawal set up last year, um, and it aims to reintroduce architects and planners back into the public sector. Um, Shumi is going to introduce all our other speakers, so for now, um, I'll just introduce her. Uh, she's a teacher, curator, and editor based in London. Um, she's a senior lecturer in architecture at Central St. Martin's College of Art and Design, and she's curator of exhibitions at um, the Royal Institute of British Architects. Um, with Finn Williams and Jack Self, Shumi co-curated the British Pavilion at the last Venice Architecture Biennale, and as a graduate of the History and Critical Thinking program, she's also taught at the AA between 2010 and 2017. So um, please join me in welcoming Shumi to the stage. <laughs> not used to applause in this room. The students <laughs> leaving, really. Um, thanks very much for... Is that okay? Shout if you can't hear me or stick your hands up or something. Um, thanks for being here on uh, such a sunny, gorgeous evening in London, um, for sort of sacrificing your time out there to be in here. But I have to say, I'm not at all surprised that it's a full house. Um, at the moment, I mean, I'm going to be very, very quick, but at the moment, um, I guess it's fair to say there's been um, a greater and greater kind of questioning of the values of civil society, I think, across the board, and particularly within architecture, what I see in my students, both here and at, at Central St. Martins, is this questioning of agency. Now, how can people involved in spatial practice and in architecture get involved in these questions of civil society, of um, civic responsibility, of social action? This seems to be um, absolutely at the core of what uh, if not the majority, then, then a large part of um, architectural thinkers, actors, spatial practitioners are concerned with at the moment. And the lack of roots to um, actually being able to have any agency and to be able to take part in the processes that shape and define the world we live in. Um, this seems to be a kind of frustration that I find, particularly among younger students whom I'm teaching, um, some of whom I can see in the room really happy that they're here. Um, but to sort of say, how can we get involved? Um, and so I've kind of grown tired over the last few years of teaching to say, no, you know what, it used to be really easy. It used to be that London County Council had the largest practice of architects in, in the world, in Europe. Um, hundreds of architects were involved in thinking about how to make the city a better place for everybody, a more equitable place for everybody, a place where healthcare and education and other kind of infrastructural services were really designed by the top thinkers um, and the top kind of creative minds, imaginative minds, and, and there was a channel in government and in policy and in other kind of um, public institutions to channel that. Um, that used to be what I used to teach in a kind of historic fashion because, of course, um, London County Council doesn't exist anymore and the, that route isn't necessarily available to all architecture students. So I can't tell you how um, proud I am to introduce or to be a part of a discussion about public practice which really seeks to kind of bring that back. So... Um, to introduce uh, Pooja Agarwal and Finn Williams, who are the co-founders of Public Practice. I guess I'm just going to indulge a little bit first. Um, I met Finn a couple of years before Pooja, I think. Um, and that was my first ever public chairing event. And we were talking about precisely this. I think we were talking about dark matter, we called it. How do, how do architects and creative thinkers and spatial practitioners get involved in this dark matter of policy, politics, governance, the things that actually make the decisions? So again, really, really pleased to be in a sort of straight line of discussion with both of you. So um, Puta now works at the GLA regeneration team, overseeing, excuse me, looking at this, overseeing strategy, policy, projects, and in Northwest London. She's previously worked at Publica, We Made That, and Studio Ilsa, and she's a trustee of the Museum of Architecture, member of Design Southeast Review Panel, and a mentor at the Stephen Lawrence Trust. You see, I have to look at the page because there's too much accomplishment. Um, <laughs> 
Finn, um, as I said, is co-founder of Public Practice and CEO. He's previously worked for OMA, General Public Agency, Croydon Council, and the GLA. So this very concerted transition from high design into actually getting stuff done on a much more um, governance level. Finn sits on the RIBA Planning Group, Rainsford Review Tax, uh, Task Force, and working in the Public Interest Advisory Group. He's visiting professor at the Institute of Innovation and Public Purpose, a tutor at the Royal College of Architecture, and with me, he was co-curator co of the British Pavilion at the 2016 Architecture Biennale. So can we put our hands together for Pooja and Finn, please? Thank you very much, Sumi. I'm going to start off talking about why we founded public practice, and then Pooja will continue to talk about how it works. So I'm going to start with a familiar diagram to most of you. It's delivery of house, housing uh, post-war in England, uh, and uh, it shows it by sector. So the private market, since the war on the left-hand side, is delivered, broadly speaking, around 100,000 homes uh, a year. Housing associations, if you can make out the colour, have, uh, have increased to around 20,000 homes a year. The biggest difference was made by, by local authorities, by public sector house building. Um, if you look at the level of house building we need to reach right now, uh, the government talks about constantly, um, the only time we reached that was roughly when about half of the homes uh, were being built by the public sector. I think what's then interesting is to overlay, uh, as one measure of public sector capacity, the percentage of architects employed in the public sector. So back in 1976, it was nearly half of all architects. Now in London, it's 0.2%. Nationally, it's just under 1%. Um, and that's, of course, only one, it is only one measure. Uh, it's important to say that public practice isn't just about housing, it isn't just about uh, architects, but I think this chart shows how important it is to rethink the role of local government uh, today and, and for us all, for built environment experts, to reconsider what it means to, to work in the public interest. So what we're going to do is trace that red line and attempt to do it through uh, what AA graduates have gone on to do over the last uh, century and a bit. Um, so going back to the 1890s, uh, this AA graduate, Owen Fleming, uh, joined the newly formed London County Council Housing of the Working Classes branch. Uh, and uh, he was 23 at the time, and he was part of a group of AA graduates um, who designed the first publicly funded uh, housing estate in London, uh, this is the Boundary Estate. Um, these were visionary, idealistic, some might say naive uh, young architects uh, who believed in Owen Fleming's world, uh, words that architecture should not be for the rich alone. They, he talks about how they worked around the clock um, to deliver decent housing on, on actually what were at that time really low budgets and showed an indifference to fatigue when public interests were involved. That political engagement uh, and social commitment amongst AA students um, continued and was, was really strong in this building in the 1920s and, and 30s. Um, so there were pioneering women architects like Elizabeth Scott, Mary Med, um, who went on to work for Hertfordshire County Council, uh, Bournemouth Borough Architects Department. Scott uh, was one of the first women um, to train at the Architectural Association uh, after it started admitting women uh, only in 1917. Um, and uh, she actually won this, the competition to design this building, the Royal Shakespeare Theatre, aged only 30, and went on to work for uh, Bournemouth Borough Architects Department after the war. Mary Med, um, and actually her husband, David Med, who also studied at the AA, uh, were behind a, a really pioneering programme of school design um, after the war, working very closely with um, a very progressive education officer in Hertfordshire County Council, uh, John Newsom. Um, and uh, Med had previously actually worked um, this is David Med had worked, I think, in the um, Department of Camouflage uh, Design during the war um, on inflatable tanks uh, to, to deceive uh, enemy reconnaissance missions. And I think it was, the, you know, you can see right there this, this shift um, 
uh, from the war to this, this post-war uh, consensus around um, work in the public interest in, in creating and building a welfare state, they both went on to work for the Ministry of Education and had a really profound impact on the design of schools across the country. So directly after the war, uh, it was really the first choice of a lot of AA graduates uh, to work for the public sector. So the really brilliant um, young students, Oliver Cox, Rose, Rosemary Quernstead, George Finch, Alan Cahoon, John Partridge, they all went to work uh, for the London County Council, as Shumi mentioned, at the time, the, the biggest architecture practice on earth. Um, and, uh, and they designed extraordinary schemes. Um, Alton West, uh, a, a, a lot of those individuals actually it worked on, um, and uh, and a, a kind of good diagram uh, in, in its two parts of the kind of debates that were going on um, between a kind of Scandinavian modernism and a Corbusian modernism uh, at the time in, in the LCC. Um, George Finch, who was at the LCC, then went on to be the borough architect of um, Lambeth. Um, uh, these are Lambeth Towers that he designed. Uh, one of just an, a, a number of incredibly talented architects who worked relatively anonymously but produced, um, I think, some of the most outstanding buildings of the, of the 20th century. Um, ones that are perhaps a little less anonymous, um, certainly recently, Neve Brown, George Benson, Alan Forsyth, all AA graduates who, who were recruited um, to Camden Architects Department uh, by Sidney Cook. And, um, and hopefully you've all had a look at the, uh, the book by Mark Swenerton on, on Cook's Camden that talks about a lot of their schemes. These no, need no introduction. Uh, extraordinary, extraordinary uh, buildings that still have real value today. Um, Benson and Forsyth, Maiden Lane Estate, uh, as well as, of course, Alexandra Road. Um, Andrew Derbyshire, the father of the current ROBA president, uh, Ivor Smith, both went on to work, uh, amongst other public sector organisations, for, um, for Sheffield City Council. Ivor Smith, uh, sorry, Andrew Derbyshire, um, designed uh, Castle Market, Sheffield City Centre, amongst a number of other buildings. Um, Ivor Smith uh, was behind Park Hill. They were both working under um, J.R. Wormersley, who is a um, really extraordinary, uh, understated, but um, important uh, city architect in Sheffield. And then by the, by the 1960s, um, A graduates were starting to head in a slightly different direction. I mean, you still had Nicholas Grimshaw joining the LCC, where he made friends with Terry Farrell sitting on the de desk next to him, uh, ended up forming um, Farrell and Grimshaw as a, as a partnership. Uh, and then, of course, spinning out on their own to become big names in their own right. Jeremy Dixon and Ed Jones both worked under Derek Walker at Milton Keynes uh, Development Corporation, where they designed this really quite extraordinary um, housing at Milton Keynes, Netherfield. Um, that time it was 1977, the last new town uh, to be built. And then Richard Rogers and Peter Cook, you're starting to see a sort of shift. I suppose you're coming towards the end of the 70s. Uh, we're in the 70s. Um, public sector house building programs, even pre-Thatcher, are starting to, to wind down. Our architects departments um, uh, are, are under pressure, uh, political pressures, as well as uh, funding constraints. And there's a kind of different model of practice emerging for AA graduates. Richard Rogers going on to form Team 4, of course, Peter Crook and Archigram. And by the time of the next generation of AA graduates, they're heading in a really different direction. So um, success was beginning to be defined for, for graduates at this point by individual prominence uh, rather than public service. And the, the, uh, the generation that succeeded them, I suppose, then went on to see working for them as a mark of success. Certainly when I finished my part one in 2004, that was the, my first choice. I went to work for REM in, in, in Rotterdam, um, but was quite frustrated. It felt like um, I was spending a lot of time trying to find the right answers to the wrong brief, um, that I was producing a kind of architecture that was really only a luxury, and, um, and I didn't really want to be part of a profession that was in serving an increasingly narrow uh, public, a very different public from those previous uh, A students. So if you, if you look at what those architects are producing today in London, I think it's quite telling. Um, OMA's building not far from here, a flat in this cost 17.5 million pounds. David Chipperfield, close by, on the same road pretty much, a flat in this cost 30 million pounds. 
Oh, 100 now? Okay, price has gone up. Okay, good. Um, I was obviously looking at the wrong flat uh, when I was going around it. Um, and Richard Rogers, at the latest time I looked on the internet, anyway, it was 140. May well have gone up. Um, so these, you know, these three schemes are all in the same borough. They're all in Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea as this. And I think there'd been this in the same way that there were a series of events in the 70s, uh, whether it was the winter of discontent, um, poll tax rights that kind of became symbols of the demise of one kind of political system and the start of a new one. Um, the, there, here we've got a, a series of events we are, we've certainly been seeing in the news um, that kind of call into question the role of local government today um, and demand a new kind of uh, municipalism. Um, Grenfell is certainly one of them and, and certainly made me uh, uh, ask who I'm, who I'm working for as an architect who I should be working for. Um, uh, and, and you're seeing the pressures that are on local authorities really now playing out um, in a public sphere in quite an extreme way. Uh, the Haringey uh, housing delivery vehicle um, and, and the protests around that, the impact that may have on the local elections in a few weeks um, being another one of them. Um, the collapse of Carillion and the extent to which that's exposed the public sector's reliance uh, on, on huge private contractors outsourcing um, to the extent that if you got rid of all those contracts you wonder what would really be left of the public sector. Um, the Sheffield uh, street trees debacle, which I don't know if many of you have followed, but it's kind of extraordinary. It's a, um, a multi-billion pound contract that Sheffield City Council have taken with, with Amy, I think, um, to repair all of their streets and hidden in the small, uh, the small writing at the bottom of the contract was that they were going to remove 4,500 street trees to make it more efficient uh, to repair the streets. Um, and uh, they're locked in this contract. And uh, I think over 3,000 trees have now been cut down um, despite huge amounts of pr protests from local residents. Um, it's now finally been paused, not stopped, um, but Sheffield have been in, in, in a bind because it's a PFI contract and um, to break that contract would, would incur huge amounts of costs uh, to them uh, and, and just exposes the kind of pressures that local authorities have been put under by the withdrawal of, of funding from the central government. And uh, another one that's hit the headlines recently, Northamptonshire County Council. So they were a kind of beacon of um, uh, Tory cost-cutting austerity when they uh, outsourced uh, pretty much all of their services and went from 4,000 staff to 150 staff back in 2014. Um, despite that uh, move, or perhaps because of it, um, they've now uh, declared themselves bankrupt uh, under, I think, Section 116 and have been forced to sell their shiny new um, headquarters back to the private centre and rent them off uh, the private sector. So I think all of these headlines like, come back to what's known in the industry, in local government, as the graph of doom. Uh, and, and this graph was, um, was actually first drawn by um, Barnet Council, I've more tastefully redrawn it <laughs> the, um, uh, just to get it high resolution. But the um, but what it shows is that you know when, when Barnet projected the costs uh, that they were facing in terms of particularly children's services and adult social care. Um, those were only increasing. At the same time, their core funding from government was only decreasing, and there became a point where uh, simply children's services and adult social care basically accounted for 100% of their budgets, and everything else uh, uh, was squeezed out. And um, we've seen that squeeze happen all over the country. What's happening is a real sea change in local government funding. In 2020, we shift from a model where local, gov local authorities get their funding from core grant from central government to a model, a devolved model, where they get their funding through business rates, um, devolved business rates, as well as council tax. Um, and local authorities are, are kind of facing oblivion and having to think about other ways to survive. One of those ways to survive is generating income themselves. And in a perverse way, the graph of doom has forced councils to be very innovative, um, have forced councils to think in entrepreneurial ways um, that they simply weren't doing before. And one of the kind of side effects of that, which I think is actually very exciting as well as slightly terrifying, is the move back into councils building again. Um, so you've now got a new generation of council-led housing delivery that's very different from the last one. 
it's, it's mixed tenure, um, it's often infill, so it's, it's not just social housing, it's private housing, it's housing for rent, um, it's, it's working with existing places rather than wipe it clean and start again. Um, and it's, in, in the best examples, working with local residents as well, and really interestingly employing very good uh, architects. So this is uh, actually one of the private parts of um, the Colville Estate Regeneration Scheme uh, by David Chipperfield, a graduate, and uh, Paul Karakuzovic. So maybe he's not only doing 30, you know, 100 million pound flats. Um, uh, this is, uh, yeah, more Hackney Council, I'll, I'll run through these quickly, but this is the latest generation of council-led housing delivery. Um, we've, got, we've had Henny Hale Brown Morrison, uh, Carrie Kusevich Carson, Adam Khan, um, I think this is Hawkins Brown, um, May Architects for Camden now. Um, uh, I think this is KCA as well for Camden. Um, uh, HMM McCrenna Lavington at Barking. Um, Another, uh, this is a, uh, a scheme for elderly people in Barking, um, Lambeth, Enfield. So all of these, and then back, uh, and at Harrow, this is actually Harrow's new uh, uh, council offices. Um, boroughs like Croydon, Hackney, Harrow, Camden, Barking, Enfield, um, they're actually raising the bar in terms of uh, residential development in London. There are very few developers producing better stuff than this. And they're doing it because they, they're not uh, having to um, lose profit at every step of the way to the, pri to the landowner, to the private developer. Um, they're, they're managing to lock that uh, uh, um, profit in and use it to, to secure better quality design and more affordable housing. It's even happening in Norfolk. Nationally, about a third of councils now uh, are now directly engaged in, in housing delivery. But to, to deliver homes, to face this kind of completely new funding landscape that councils face, they need a new set of skills. Uh, in fact, they need to rebuild some of the skills they, own, they lost decades ago. And at the GLA, when we asked councils what kind of skills they need, well, 96% of them said that they need more uh, planning and place shaping skills, but particularly proactive planning skills, skills to get councils on the front foot to be creative, to be entrepreneurial, get entrepreneurial again. The issue is that they can't find those people. So funding is an issue, um, but it's, it's actually become less significant a barrier over the last few years. And um, councils are often in a position to appoint people, but when they, when they go to recruit, they're simply not finding the right um, experience uh, and quality of candidates applying. As an example of that, in the East of England region, there are currently 115 vacancies, uh, in, uh, planning vacancies, and they're spending nearly a million pounds a year just advertising for those posts, let alone filling them. As a result, they're increasingly using contractors, yes, but also agency staff. Um, agency staff that cost 30, 40 pounds an hour to process sort of you know, day to day planning applications, but they also have a cost. Uh, over the longer term in terms of local knowledge uh, and in terms of, uh, I think, consistency and, and to a certain extent, accountability. And it was because of this trend that we saw firsthand, Pooja and I, working at the GLA, because of these conversations we'd had with boroughs, like Sri, who, who you'll hear from shortly, that we collectively felt we needed to come up with an alternative model, a different way of accessing uh, a new generation of planning skills uh, at a lower cost than going through agencies, but in, but in a way that really rebuilt the public sector's capacity uh, to, to plan for the public good. So I'm gonna hand over to Pooja now to explain how the model works. Hi. So what is public practice? Public practice is an independent new social enterprise that is placing talented architects and planners into local government to work for the public good. Our mission is really to build the public sector's capacity to improve the quality and equality of the built environment. So public practice was born out of the GLA. It, you know, the idea was born there, um, all the evidence was sort of gathered there, but it's become its own independent charity now, um, company now. And um, it's, it's, it's a kind of small team. There's four people working full time. Finn, uh, my fellow co-founders, the chief exec, Nikki, Frederick, and Josh. 
and we've got a brilliant board. We've got Jules, the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Regeneration Skills as a chair, and a really great collection of people with different skills helping us kind of grow over the next few years. So I'm just going to talk you through how public practice actually works as a model. Public practice acts as a broker. It attracts talented architects and planners and places them into local authorities to work in strategic roles. The associates are directly employed by the local authorities, and that's really to embed them within their placements. And public practice spends um, oversees the research that um, the associates do as a cohort, which is 10% of their time. The authorities pay a membership fees um, to public practice to be part of the um, to be to get um, to host a placement and directly employ the associates on 12 months fixed term contracts. And the salaries range from about £30,000 to £50,000, depending on the skills and experience of the associate. The running costs of public practice are cross subsidised by public and private sector supporters. And um, in turn, supporters get access to the research and development that the associates undertake. And also, they really sort of um, supporting the kind of quality of public planning. So the, um, the placements range, when you talk about planning, we talk about planning in its broadest sense. And I think over the years, planning has sort of siloed into kind of, I guess, placemaking is the word that's used now to describe, in a way, what we describe planning as. So ranging from housing delivery to design-led densification, to kind of more policy, like local plans, to um, you know, new tools like digital innovation. And the associates spend 90% of their time doing these, this, um, their role. And what's really, really important to us is making sure that even within their local authority, if housing delivery is their main job, they're still working in a kind of cross-cutting strategic role. And these roles are um, new roles that are developed for public practice. So they're not existing roles. And that's kind of key to what public practice is about. It's sort of changing the culture of how planning is working at the moment. So the 10% of their time, which is what public practice oversees, is the research and development program. And it's done in a range of different ways. So there, there's a kind of induction week. So it's a quite intensive first week before associates start in their placements to really get an understanding of how public sector works from procurement, everyone's favorite, really understanding the kind of technicalities of that to actually the po like politics, you know, working in a political environment is a really interesting situation and something that, you know, when you work in private sector, you're not really, you, it's a kind of different world. And I guess um, both Finn and I moving from private sector to public sector had to sort of learn all of these different things on the job, as it were, and sort of over time, learned who the right person is to talk to about this so where do you access this information about this particular thing and you know we sort of design public practice in such a way that we can support the cohort through the um, through the kind of induction week but throughout the year there's a lot of opportunities for research and development and really peer-to-peer -peer support so the, the, the way the program works, it's like a, a year-long program and it starts, the placement starts in April and f follows through to the following April and that's really to do with the kind of financial year that local um, government gets sort of funding for. So we um, launched in October and had a kind of two-month process of, um, of applications and then a sort of longer process in terms of shortlisting the applications which I can talk through in a bit more detail. And then over the year, every other Friday, the associates get together as a cohort and really spend their day doing, um, getting sort of learning in the morning and then doing more kind of their own like research, which is sort of affiliated with the local authorities they're working for. So um, when we talk about associates, you know, for us, it's a whole range of different skills. Associates can be planners, associates can be urban designers, architects, regeneration experts, historic environment experts, tech experts, um, chartered surveyors, and, and anyone sort of who has an interest really in the built environment. And I guess 
this has been spoken about, you know, already by Shumi, like, you know, what is the offer for associates? Really, it's this idea for working for the public good, being part of, like, our civic society and sort of having an impact on, on the way the city, the places we live in and how they work. <coughs> Um, the other offers are really is, is, is the fact that you're part of a cohort and the kind of support you get from the cohort, but also from public practice and, and the kind of research and development as well, I think is something that's, uh, you know, is a really interesting opportunity to kind of explore issues that actually working in public sector can be, you know, you're constantly you have to firefight. There's so many different things that are going on, and, and lots of authorities are doing these things uh, sort of, again, separately. So this gives the opportunity to kind of work together and try and solve some of these problems together. So we had um, a really brilliant response to our first launch um, when we were looking for applications. We had 212 applications for what we were then saying um, were 16 placements. And we had a really good split between gender, um, in terms of age, so we say, you know, you, you need sort of a minimum of three years experience. And I guess uh, it, it was really good to see the kind of range of experience that people brought to the table. And also in terms of discipline, I guess uh, we saw a majority of applications from architects, which is, which is really interesting to us, but also I think it's uh, partly, I guess, that Finn and I and our work kind of journey as architects into the world of public sector is probably what influenced that. But, you know, we're, it, it was really interesting to see people from um, landscape architects to kind of people with heritage backgrounds and social science backgrounds really applying to be part of public practice. And we had a good um, sort of mix of diversity higher than the normal, um, the kind of shocking diversity of the built environment in general. And this is a snapshot of our first cohort. And um, because this is local government, we've got PERD at the moment, which is when you can't make any new political announcements. So the announcements will be made in mid-May and we'll be updating our website. So when we talk about authorities, we talk about local authority, we mean local authorities, we mean development corporations or combined authorities or even other public sector organisations like HS2. And I guess Finn touched on this really, it was, it was kind of responding to a need that um, we were hearing from local authorities re about the difficulty they're having to access talent. And, and also what's really uh, important is this is actually much cheaper than using agencies because agencies are really expensive but they also charge a lot of money if you want to keep someone on. So their whole model works on actually people not being permanently employed in, um, in, in local in the local authority. And then the other thing is really this kind of opportunity for collective research and knowledge that will sort of grow over time. So we had, um, in the same way associates are applying to be part of public practice, we've um, local authorities also put in an application because like I said earlier, they're kind of new roles and it's really important that the roles that we're offering are really interesting strategic roles and not roles that already exist. And um, these, um, these are the final uh, local authorities where we've placed associates in. And again, it's, it, you know, our first cohort was London in the South East. And it's a kind of interesting mix of um, Council, the local authorities like South Cambridgeshire, um, Epping Forest, Croydon, but also kind of cross-cutting roles like TFL property, where people, um, our associates will be looking at the property across the TFL um, portfolio. So I'm going to talk you through some of our um, associates and what they're doing and where they're placed. And like Shumi, I'm going to have to refer to my notes because we've got a really super talented bunch of people and I can't remember all the amazing things they do. So we have Ioni Braddock. Ioni is an architect, educator, and a volunteer. And she worked as a project architect and was the head of PR at um, Arcio for a number of years. She, I guess one of her expertise is around community engagement and design workshops. And she's done that at a number of schools at, um, for the London Festival of Architecture and for Community Land Trust in Lewisham. 
So she's going to be working in Epping Forest as an urban designer in the planning and economics team. And really, it's about sort of bringing the conversation of design and quality into, into the local plan and making sure that any master planning, uh, the sites that are coming out of the master plan, have that kind of conversation about quality, making sure the quality of these sites are like really good. Uh, also providing support and proposals that sit outside the master plan and also working with other consultants who might be looking at large sites in Epping Forest. We have Akil Skeff Smith, and he's an urban designer and researcher. And one of his uh, research interests is around the socio-spatial dynamics of urban camps and refugees. He's built a number of installations responding to this research as well at the Architecture Foundation, at the Brainchild Festival, and at um, TED UCL Women Talks. So he's placed in Croydon, where he's going to be a project officer in the spatial planning service team. And what's really interesting about this is that Akil actually grew up around Croydon and spent a lot of time um, hanging out as a teenager in Croydon. And he, you know, walking around with him in Croydon now, he, you know, he points out to certain places where he's like, oh, you know, I used to hang out here um, at this bus stop as a teenager. And look, it's really interesting how it's changed. And he has this like really in-depth knowledge of the place, which he's really Really keen to be part of the, the sort of upcoming change and being able to sort of work with communities to, to bring that change forward. So he's going to be involved in the design and delivery of meanwhile projects in public realm and cultural projects within the kind of metropolitan town centre and also working with a number of external stakeholders and partners in bringing the, forward the kind of design and delivery of these projects. We have Kathy McEwen. So Kathy is a town planner and with about 25 years of experience. And she used to work in public sector. So she worked in Camden and in Hackney and actually started the kind of conversation around design in, in these boroughs and started these design awards there. She then worked at CAPE, um, for a, which is Design Council CAPE, for a number of years. And it continues to be um, involved with CAPE as a built environment expert. So she's working in Hounslow, and she's the um, principal urban design officer in the housing planning and regulatory services. And I, I like to think of her as a design czar. So she's bringing design into everything that's coming forward in Hounslow. And she's going to do that through creating frameworks and tools, such as um, creating a new design review for the local, for, um, for the local authority find like creating a um, best portfolio of case studies, which again, it's like creating that um, body of knowledge and research that can be used by the borough um, in, in time to come. And she's also de um, developing a design award program. We have Jan Ackenhausen, and he's an urbanist, and he's got a background in sociology and cultural production. And he also worked in the public sector, but actually in Brussels. and. You know, he, his role was about integrating um, workspace into the city, and that's something that's very relevant in in London. And actually, he's placed in the old Oak Park Royal Development Corporation, which has a lot of industrial land. So one of the things he he's doing there is bringing forward these kind of place making projects, looking at public realm, meanwhile use early activation projects. Again, looking to integrate the kind of industry work and the city. And um, he'll also be providing design advice on planning applications and in policy that's coming forward for OBDC. We have Hannah Lambert, who used to work at the Regional Development Agency in, in Yorkshire and um, was kind of responsible for like development framework strategies and then worked at the LLDC. And now she's going to be working in Newham as a senior regeneration manager, looking at estate regeneration so she's basically leading the Canning Town and Custom House program, estate regen program. And what's really interesting is this is the first time that Newen have developed a kind of planning application at this scale. And again, you know, her role is really making sure that the design quality is, um, is up there with this kind of council-led housing coming forward. We also have Sheba Shetty, who actually studied here. She did the, I think, the housing and urbanism course. And she um, used to work in the urban development department in Bangalore in India, and worked and built and led the sort of design team 
um, and looked at kind of transit-oriented developments and street design. And she'll be working at TFL, the city planning, as an assistant urban designer. And with her experience of working at sort of traffic in India, which I can tell you is uh, <laughs> very challenging, she will be working uh, for TFL, looking at kind of streetscape design, looking at kind of, again, design quality. How do you make sure that what's coming forward is friendly for pedestrians and for cyclists? And also we'll be looking at design review we have Lithia, who is based in Tower Hamlets, but I'm not going to talk about it too much because Shree is here, who will tell you a bit more about it. And embarrassing Tom Fox by putting his face up on the screen, but he can tell you a bit more about what he does. So um, to, to sort of achieve what we want to do, I think it's not just about the public sector or the private sector. I think it's about everyone sort of working together. And we have a sort of cross-section of supporters from the public sector and the private sector, so government bodies, developers, and consultants. And it is this idea of investing in local authority planning capacity improving the speed, improving the quality of planning, and also creating the sort of shared research and knowledge that grows over time. So our six founding partners are the GLA, the Local Government Association, Future Cities Catapult, Peabody, British Land and Barclay Group, and we have three further partners, Historic England, LNQ, and Karakusovic Cast and Architects and a number of contributors who are really interested with what we're doing and kind of helping support the research and development program over the year. So in terms of public practice itself, we will be launching the next round um, of applications for the cohort in October. And the idea then is to grow and sort of repeat the cycle every six months instead of a year. We're also looking to grow nationally. So our first cohort is in the southeast, but we're already having conversations across the country because, you know, in many ways, this is a problem that is, is larger across the country in terms of finding the right skills. And in terms of our impact, I mean, ultimately for us, it is about improving the quality and equality of places. And we're doing that through a number of different routes, through us communicating the importance of public planning and changing the perceptions of planning, getting more talented architects and other designers to work in local government. We're doing that through the recruitment program, but also through the research and development program, sort of changing the culture of working. So this is where we are at the moment, and we're hoping to reverse that trend, and we're looking forward to some people in this room applying to be part of public practice in October. And you can get in touch with us, find out a bit more about what we're doing, and like I said, mid-May we'll be updating our website, and you'll be able to get more um, understanding about all the different placements and the different people who are going to be part of public practice this year. Thank you. Yeah, let's take, take a seat now. Um, wow, OK. Um, two tiny bits of housekeeping that I forgot right at the beginning. Um, one to say, oh, hi. <laughs> One to say, um, if you have phones and so on, totally fine to take pictures of the great slides and speakers, but would you mind putting them on silent? And the second bit of housekeeping is to say that obviously there's, there's lots of information to take in. And thank you so much, uh, Ruta and Finn, for the sort of scale and ambition of the project. I've already got tons of questions. So the second point was just to please make a note. My students will be laughing at me, I think, if uh, those of them that are here in the room. But please make notes of things that you have to ask later. We've got about 45 minutes um, to ask questions and find out more and perhaps try and challenge some of the ideas that have been put forward. But there's so much coming and there's so much more coming that you, you might forget. So do, do take notes and, and kind of make mental notes or, or whatever you need to do to make sure that we have a good discussion at the end later. So um, yeah, huge scale and ambition that you took us there through um, and just still getting my head around some of the figures and some of the numbers that you presented. Like, you know, 
91% of councils using external agents, that means nine out of ten, more than nine out of ten times the person involved is perhaps not necessarily involved in a long-term commitment of what, what might be happening to a part of the city or a project that affects lots and lots of people. I mean, really, that's what that means. Um, and then also, thank you for presenting the ambition of it, which allows me to well, allows us all to think. Well, maybe there are opportunities to reverse and get back to some of the fantastic examples that you showed um, from the middle of the 20th century. So, to hear a bit more about the sort of how reality, how how it might be working, um, we have. Sripriya and Tom. So we'll start with Sripriya. Sripriya Sitaka is an architect who, is, who heads the place shaping team at the London Borough of Tower Hamlets and is responsible for delivery of design and conservation in the borough with 17 years of, more than 17 years of experience in projects including public realm, regeneration, town centre, redevelopment um, frameworks and master plans both in the private and public sector. So hopefully you can kind of bring to life a little bit some of the projects that, that might be happening under public practice, but also kind of how you got involved and why you got involved and, and why this is going to work. Really. Thanks. Thank you, and it's, uh, it's really nice to be here and to be part of this conversation. So I've been involved in the conversations with Finn for well, over three years when you initially started talking about how this could work in public practice. So I had the place shaping team and we currently have a team of 10 officers out of which 40% of them have architecture, urban design skills. But that kind of shows how the skill set in the local authorities have been shrinking over the years. And what Finn explained earlier on is we've moved from actually building to just managing. And I see the way the role is defined has now become very much about management. In a way, when Finn was talking earlier about how we're expected to give the right answer to wrong briefs. Our role or the team's role has become more about how do we ensure that we can make them manage to write good briefs. So that's kind of how I see our team's role has evolved because we're not building as an authority because of the way the stock transfers happen and it's mostly with housing association. But my everyday work involves a lot in questioning the briefs and helping people to write the briefs that are appropriate for the sites that they want to develop. So we've been very fortunate to have an associate placed in our team who started in April this year. And uh, Lucia Carrara, she would be working with us uh, for a year and hopefully longer. And her role is very much focused around looking at high density living. What does it actually mean to live in the places that we are delivering in the borough? And as some of you would know, the level of applications in the London Borough of Tower Hamlets has been quite increasingly become huge. And they're also for very, very tall, very dense residential development and office. But we as an authority have struggled to find the resources to actually do the level of research we would like to undertake to actually know what is, is it actually like to live in those buildings? And that's something that we as an authority have been very keen to undertake. But we, of course, are short of resource because it's quite a lot of time goes in just managing the level of application that comes in. And this was a resource that was made available. And we are really grateful that we have Lucia. She's an architect, urbanist, and also a PhD scholar from Bartlett. And that research skills that she brings in has been fantastic. She's been with us now for three weeks, and we are already looking at coming up with the framework for how we would carry out this research. So that's kind of very briefly, but I'm very happy to kind of feed in as we continue the conversation. Well, I suppose we've heard from somebody who's, let's say, hosting um, somebody from public practice. And I guess um, I, will, I would like to ask you a bit more about sure. um, how that can, how that, how you imagine that might play out to be useful, and and also what wasn't possible before. But before we get into that, uh, I also want to introduce and hear a bit more from Tom. Tom Fox is an architect with experience working on projects across architecture, urban design, territorial planning, and environmental activism. So a huge scale um, of concerns. And I certainly remember when Tom was studying here. I think I was studying here too. So. Um, It'd be good to hear a little bit about what brought you, or rather what took you to public practice and what you might be doing. So Tom recently joined St Albans City and District Council as a principal planning officer as part of the public practice programme. 
and um, yeah, tell us a bit more about what you'll be doing in the role. Um, it's actually slightly bigger than that even. It's um, St Albans Council and the neighbouring council um, decorum who actually on my first day I discovered were also employing me. <laughs> um, so I'm working across two local authorities just outside London. Um, on um, in, in both cases in a kind of major projects team which essentially sits between um, planning which deals with um, those of you who haven't kind of got into the world of architecture fully yet um, deals with, with policy and, and plans and, and kind of being forward looking and proactive um, and development management which, which deals with, with planning applications and negotiating planning applications so it kind of sits between you know this kind of proactive role and and the everyday kind of I guess the kind of negotiation of, of particular particular sites um, in particular as the major projects team suggests it's it's kind of large they're large um, strategic sites which um, as you can imagine just outside London are largely um, kind of chunky urban extensions to to towns um, and and cities um, and so yeah so my role is really to um, to be really particular, to, to, lead, to lead on the negotiation of, of, of one of those particular big sites, which is for about 10,000 homes and 10,000 jobs. Um, and also, at the moment, I'm writing a charter um, for the principles of, of, of what all these, collectively, all of these um, urban extensions should, should follow, um, which is a kind of dream brief. I mean, if you, mm. if you had that in an architecture practice, you'd be over the moon. And, and, but it's, it's kind of quite an amazing brief to think of what I can do in a year and potentially even further. Um, in terms of why um, or how I got into public practice, um, it's, it's actually a remarkably straight line, at least in my own head. Um, at least it sort of starts in this room and at the moment is it's ending in this room. Um, but I've, I've kind of worked at the, at the edges of architecture and the reason that, that um, I wanted to get into public practice is is essentially about agency, which is the term you, you started this evening with. Um, and that's, you know, as, as, as has been discussed, there's a sort of, um, a lot of decisions about design have already been made by the time an architect gets involved. Um, and we all kind of know that. I think I, I un, even I underestimated quite how, how much, to what extent that, that was true. And the last few weeks have really um, opened my eyes to the, ex, to the extent to which design is, is required at much, much earlier stages. Um, and no one's, question why I'm there as a designer, which kind of speaks to how important people think design is at that stage. Um, and, I, and it's and it essentially, I've, I've never felt so useful in a, in a job as I have so far, um, which, is, which is kind of, it's not because I've been kind of work, undervalued in previous jobs, it's just that I've never, I've never, I, I've never worked in a, in a situation where design skills are scarce. You know, you, you study, you're surrounded by architects, you graduate, you're surrounded by architects, everyone seems to be an architect. Um, you marry an architect probably, I don't know, some people do. You know, that, but actually, um, you know, to be in that position of, of scarcity is, is, is really, is really quite, quite rewarding um, and, and quite exciting. Um, I'd say you know, it's not agency in the sense of kind of megalomania, you know, the numbers are, are kind of vast. Um, I think it's actually, um, there's, there's three things really that, 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 in terms of agency, that are really kind of key for me. The first is, um, as, as Finn was talking about with some of those earlier kind of examples that we're following, there's a much wider spectrum of what you can call design and what is design in, in the public sector. It's everything from writing briefs, you know, as, as you were saying, to um, procurement, to commissioning pieces of research, to, um, you know, to, to negotiating master plans, to draw, you know, drawing. You know, I'm still trying to find some drawing. I've got some tracing paper in my first week. Um, so it's really this much broader spectrum of what design can be, and that's incredibly kind of empowering and exciting. Um, leading on from that, there's also this sense that you're also defining the problem as well as coming up with a solution. And I think, you know, something we tell our first year students, some of them are in the room, like you, you, you can also develop the question and develop it spatially. A lot of questions are thought of as economic problems or social problems. Maybe or, the most important bit, no? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. And we, and we all kind of know it, but, it's, but still like, architecture's in this mindset of, of solving problems as opposed to being at the table when they're defined, whether that's, you know, time scales, how long are we talking about, whether it's the scale of a problem, is it a high street, is it, is it larger, is it smaller, is it a number of sites? I think these kind of questions which are so critical to finding the, you know, the, the, the right answer to the right brief. Yeah. Um, are, are key. So, so working on defining the problem 
Um, and then thirdly, um, it's, it's, I mean, as you can imagine, I'm working on pretty average urban extensions, you know, as, as, as I've seen them in the first few weeks. Um, and that's just a problem that you, I, I, I wouldn't, in the architect's practices I've been working in, get asked about. So there's this, there's this, is For example, it, what do you mean when you've been working on them? And, yeah. um, it, well, in, in terms of other, in terms of other, I mean, there's, 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 I've been working in London, us? well, suburban housing on, mm. on a mass scale is not something I typically got asked about. I've been doing a lot of reading recently about <laughs> having to get up to speed with the kind of uh, intricacies of suburban housing. Um, but it's, that's not really something on, on a large scale that architects typically have coming through their front door. Yeah. And, um, and, and I think, you know, the Grenfell's a good example of, of what happens when architecture or design turns a blind eye. And I think, you know, it's, 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 it's impossible when your role is, in my case, overseeing design across two authorities. In a sense, I'm responsible for as the only designer, mm. all the design that comes comes in and out of, of the authority, in a sense. I mean, I, hopefully that's not quite the case, but like, I'm going to be... I've already looked at 11 master plans in in three weeks, and it's about <laughs> 14,000 homes, and I, that's more than I've looked at in my t- entire career mm. up to now. And that's... So that there is a set... Uh, you know, if people do put drawings in front of me, it's my responsibility to comment on the design quality, and I think that... Yeah inability to say no that's not you know that's not big enough that's not you know good enough like, it's, it's, that's typically the kind of role architects have especially you know in, in, in London practices you, you, ex- you, you turn projects away if they're not good enough right that's just not an issue that's not a possibility if you're working in a local authority right I guess on that note I, I wanted to ask you through Priya if we can wind it back just a little bit um, before three years ago when when Finn, I guess, it started mooting this idea. Can you describe, because you are an architect and you have been working in, in um, a local authority, could you describe maybe some of the frustrations that you might find, or perhaps even some of the things that you found yourself having to learn to operate in a, in a public authority? Because I don't think it's easy for people to imagine quite how you sit, which is why this sure. needs to be created. Sure. Yeah. So I joined public authority in London Borough of Tower Hamlets. It's my first authority that I've ever worked in public practice before. So I joined nine years ago. And before that, I had worked as an architect back in India and also here in urban design practices for a couple of years. And the reason for me, for my move, was triggered by wanting to work in something larger than just doing housing designs for private clients. And I went through a number of practices before I could actually find out that what I was seeking was much closer in a public sector. So that's kind of really how I came to public practice. When I joined the authority, the team had three officers in design and conservation, two urban designers and one conservation officer. That was it. That was our team. And we were managing a huge number of applications even at that time. I'm talking 2009, around that time. And when I first, during the first few months, it was very uncomfortable having to sit in a room full of architects and actually having to tell them something is not good enough. Because there was a conflict about what my actual role was. Am I actually going to design every single scheme that comes through the department or Really, what is my role? And things that I hold as important, is that something that's shared? And what role does policy play? Because it's very easy to use policy and say, it doesn't need policy X, Y, Z. But how do you then actually engage with an audience who are equally trained in that field? Mm -hmm. So that was kind of a real difficulty. And it took me a few months before I could actually carve out what my role actually is, and which is why I was referring back to the role of uh, developing and managing briefs, what is appropriate. And this also kind of helped me to understand and appreciate the place that I was working for, not only as an authority, but as Tower Hamlets, and what is it about the place? Because before that, I had worked in a number of practices which had projects maybe in Slough, maybe in Lincoln, and other locations. And I only had a very limited understanding of how everything about that place actually can be seen in a site that I was working in. Whereas here, working for the local authority, a project somewhere on Brick Lane or, and say, in Canary Wharf had much wider implications for the Tower Hamlets borough as a whole. And that was the biggest learning for me. And also learning to respect boundaries, and you're not designing 
every side, but you're having professional conversation where you're able to communicate matters um, which are very subtle, but at the same time important to draw out. And that's kind of been the big challenge in learning for me. So I guess um, that was leading to what do you think is the space that public practice is then carving out that hasn't been possible before that you sure. see hopefully will be possible yes. now? So as I said, when I joined almost nine, ten years ago, we were three people in the team. And since then, the scale of applications, the number of homes and the targets that the borough has to deliver has only increased considerably. But the team's size kind of increased very disproportionate to the tasks that we have in hand. And we have all often kind of struggled to find time to actually reflect on the work that we are doing and also the projects that are being delivered on site. And when it comes to actually how you spend your time as a team, it's often the statutory requirement that takes precedence. So you have to comment on planning application. That's your bread and butter. And that's why you are there as a department. You have to make sure that uh, conservation matters are looked at and re the relevant uh, policy documents are prepared. But outside this, carrying out research, looking at uh, evaluation of build schemes, is a kind of thing, nice thing to do, but it's not something that you have to do. So that's the bit that we felt the most important in order to inform future policy, but we don't have the time to do it. And it's not good enough just letting that work to be done through a consultant, because there's a lot of information that's in-house available that just having somebody to do the work for two months and produce a report wasn't going to do it which is why when the public practice opportunity came up, we said this is a good opportunity because the person would be placed in the team and they would have access to this resource and we can engage with them on a daily basis as matters arise. So that's kind of how. And I imagine you get people, sorry, I imagine you get people that you wouldn't necessarily get applying to work at, at a council. Absolutely. I think that's also something we faced three years ago when we were trying to recruit for a borough urban design officer. The recruitment process lasted for an entire a year. We went out to recruit thrice and the quality of candidates we were getting did not really meet the kind of skill set that we were looking for and the experience and the expertise. So final question because I've got yeah. some for you sure. and I, I hope you guys have questions yeah. too but why do you think that is? What is the perception of design within public service or public sector? I mean, I mean honestly I don't know but it looks to me that it's either seen is probably a perception of an image that it's not something that's cool enough for people to apply, maybe. Or if we are seen as very much a reactionary department, not just our hamlets, but generally in planning. It could also be that uh, it's not attractive enough for other reasons that I can't kind of say. But, or probably people with that level of experience and expertise are probably better off financially elsewhere. A number of reasons, but these are the three things that we could think of. What do you think, Tom? What do you think is the reason why there's a sort of groundswell now, but perhaps there hasn't been before? I mean, you went to college here. Do you think there was a, a kind of big urge to move into public service, or not really? Um, I think one of the I mean, one of the reasons I hadn't applied for um, to work in the public sector before now is is the particular structure of, of public practice, which which is this kind of um, mixture between on the one hand being involved in a really big bureaucracy most of the time which which allows you to look at that's the only way you know really big developments can be can be kind of strategized and, and planned and, and negotiated and that and so we can use all of that organization in order to to, to kind of do all these strange things like design you know procurement processes and, and have this kind of say larger agency um, but on the other side of that, we're also a group of um, eighteen, let's say twenty, because you guys are involved as well. Um, it, which, which kind of works more like um, this kind of network practice. Which you know, a lot of my friends who graduated at the same time as me, kind of that's the first thing you do. You know, you have a few friends that you kind of have a similar m mindset with, and one of them's on another side of the, mm. the planet. But you kind of do competitions, and you get a website, and you come up with a name, and all the rest of it. Like we've all kind of been through that kind of network thing. You do things through Skype, you do a competition, and that that somehow the public practice network of 18 of us, which is quite a nice size, um, kind of mirrors that in a way. Like we can we ask questions of each other all the time. I'm sure lead to sort of side mm. projects and so there's this quite particular um, structure which is which is on the one hand 
enabling you to do really interesting projects, but on the other hand, intellectually quite rewarding as well, I think. And I think that's, that's for me, why I've kind of waited for this opportunity to come along. I mean, I met Finn like eight years ago in a pub and talked about it, so I'm kind of inviting my time. It's taken a lot of time. Um, yeah. But so, so I think, I think there's, 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 there is that sense that you, like, and the same as working in big, big architecture practices, like you want to be doing it on your own terms, I think, especially, yeah. you know, you know if you, if, especially young graduates, like you, 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 you do feel you still need to learn and you still need to kind of explore different ways of doing architecture. And, you know, working in, a big practice can also mm. null that as well, numb that as well. So I don't think that it's unique to public practice. I think it's it's just fine that this is a particular organisation that allows quite a particular way of, of practicing actually and organising your own practice. I think that's really important. The kind of almost gateway nature of it, where you can recognise some some aspects of having an intellectual relationship with mm. other people who might be working on different projects, but there's a sort of independence that's not the world of, say, um, acronyms that are involved or kind of come up with, with public sector work. Mm -hmm. I guess there's a bit of that because you mm -hmm. have to engage with that, but it's something that helps you perhaps to engage with that. Can I have one question with you two before, before turning it open to, to the rest of the floor? What do you think is different about, I mean, you, you started off the presentation um, from public practice with a kind of past model of the possibilities and ambitions and results of uh, large-scale architectural vision within public sector work and that that came after a cataclysmic event for the nation and that's kind of so we're in a slightly different situation now there's lots and lots of parallels but maybe you could speak a bit more about what's different about now and therefore I guess what's different about public practice and the model you're offering um. We're, we're still discovering that. I think the situation is changing the whole time. Um, I think if you look at uh, the generation of the new generation of council housing, it says quite a lot about the difference. Actually, um, you can read it almost in the in the economic models and the architecture of that this new generation of, of council housing compared to called council-led housing compared to the last one. It's. Um, there's fundamentally quite a strong commercial driver behind that, this new generation of council-led housing. Um, working in the public sector now, uh, because of the constraints imposed by central government, uh, lack of central government funding, um, means that you, you need to be able to speak the same language, actually, as mm -hmm. developers, as, as um, agents. Um, you need to really understand about viability uh, but use those tools for the public good. Um, and in, uh, I think there probably um, wasn't such a strong uh, need for that when you had the full weight of the funding of the state behind you. Um, I think you, you, are, you do have to be more nimble uh, uh, and, um, and work in a more networked way with private sector partners, um, whether that's just commissioning really great architecture practices um, and other designers, which is something that I did a lot of in Croydon, learning when to step outside the council as when to step in. Um, and, uh, and that can be really valuable. Yeah. Um, so it's not just a case of you know, rebuilding huge architecture departments and locking the door. Um, it's, uh, it, it's a far more network way of working. Um, and I think there's a huge difference in terms of the relationship between the state and citizens. Um, the, you know, the, obviously there's been a massive shift in power between uh, the public sector and the private sector, certainly since 1979. Mm. Um, but for me, the biggest shift in power that feels like it's happening now is actually towards sort of civic activism, um, the role of the citizen, the expectations of the citizen to have a say in how their city is made. And pu the public sector needs to understand that they need to reorientate themselves towards that, change the way they relate to citizens, um, and form a kind of new kind of... Um, uh, coalition uh, yeah. and um, and that uh, requirement wasn't on a lot of the big top-down public sector led schemes in the 50s, 60s and 70s and sometimes that had pretty bad consequences and um, we can't afford to do that anymore um, but there are huge benefits of, of being more intelligent about the way we, we work with um, work with the public. Mm. I don't know if you've got more things to add Peter, but, but Karen I think Oh, I think that's sort of covered most of it. Yeah, please. I think um, this is quite informal. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
a one kind of tension which I mean which I think distinguishes working in the public sector now from from after the war is is how the extent to which um, in order to be effective certainly as I perceive my role um, it, it being undeclared and kind of under the radar is a position of incredible power and strength actually um, and I think architecture in you know on the one hand public practice has to be kind of high profile in order to ra- you know, raise the profile of, of, of public sector planning but on the other hand in order to um, I mean, for, for partic- my particular case, I'm, I'm not going to change the way suburban development happens in the Coral and St Albans by taking the pen and drawing a better master plan. Mm. You know, it, it's 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 finding a, a, a the kind of tools that you can guide this kind of repetitive model, which 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 spins itself out over huge parts of England. Um, you have to find a kind of undeclared quite quiet way of changing that because otherwise it will be shot down and it's not it, and it, it won't be taken on board by the people that actually go ahead and do it and I think so there's this kind of tension between on the one hand being heroic and they, which which I think the, the Neve Browns and, and these guys could and and you know the, obviously the political context was incredibly different and what architecture kind of as a whole was able to say about itself was completely different but I think now in order to really you know deal with kind of network late capitalism you need to be a bit more kind of shifty and kind of yeah. deal with, and deal with the kind of underlying issues and 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 find like mechanisms and tools and that's what really excites me about working yeah. in the public sector as well because you don't have to be the guy with the great drawing that's that's, that's which is what architects always are yeah. and always turn up with a better scheme and it's easy it's easy to knock that down and it's and then you start again and that's and i think that's that's something that really excites me about bureaucracy and and regulation is 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 the power in being kind of undeclared and just yeah. just change the rules like the other thing i'll probably add is um with the number of constraints that local authorities are facing at the moment there is there is a kind of a need to be a bit more innovative and trying to understand how to work with these constraints which perhaps um, post-war people had that power, they had the finance, they had that kind of support that we yeah. have this big vision while now it's more about how do we create revenue funding, how do we in, in these constraints create a new sort of company that can get funding from this type of bank to be able to deliver this so there's a kind of sense of constant creation of new ways of doing things rather than having the kind of for like having the support to do it so there's yeah. there's a, quite a lot of really interesting thinking that comes from constraints and i guess that's what architects are also really good at is working Absolutely. within constraints but perhaps not as you say not coming up with the heroic top-down solution that can be drawn on one piece of paper but rather learning these disparate skills that are slightly messier that need to be yeah i was just going to also add that Perhaps there's also the graph that Finn showed about the the doom. <laughs> the doom. <laughs> there, it's often also the question of you know, do you choose adult social care? Is that where you want to invest? Do you want to do children's services? Do you want to have libraries? Often these are seen as separate elements, mm-hmm. and that as if people have to choose. Whereas in the past, architecture planning meant that all of those were seen together. So it's not a cho- choice of okay, do you need schools? or is it planning separate? Mm. And I mean, I can definitely say, I think we are coming to a stage where with all the public sector funding cuts, a lot of these departments are shrinking because they're saying, is this necessary? Maybe we should spend more. Mm. But actually adult social care is also about placemaking. It's also about schools. It's also about public health. That separation seems to be a big change now. Yes, absolutely. Where you're having to vote, what would you choose? Mm. So that's kind of how it's even. So it's something I kind of mentioned before. It's like even within um, within planning and within it's become so separated. So actually, even when I was reading up what everyone's title is, all the associates where they're working, they're all working in different teams. You know within the local authority, so it might be the economic team, it might be the regeneration team, it might be the housing delivery team, it might be planning policy team, and actually that in itself is very symbolic of of the kind of state of architecture and planning within local authorities. Like, where does it actually sit? Is it an economic driver? Is it a mm-hmm. social driver? Is it... Um, okay. It, well, that sort of exciting spread seems like a good moment to throw it open to you. Um, 
There is a microphone. You may or may not need it, but could I ask? Um, you will need it? For the recording, you will need it. Okay, so do wait for the microphone. But if you have questions, things to say, comments, reflections, or, or challenges to the three people here, not me, um, could you stick your hands up, please, and, and the, micro will, uh, the microphone will come to you. No? Yeah, come on. <laughs> Hi, um, it's great to hear from you. I think public practice is an absolutely amazing, amazing movement that's beginning, really fantastic. Um, there's lots of questions I would ask, but I'll ask a more practical one. Um, you mentioned, uh, Priya, about the research, and I think that's fantastic that it's like becoming a question of, well, we need more research, it's an awareness and um, great thing. Um, and I was wondering if you had particular thoughts or any of you about um, what particular research you've come across which has proved most effective in the fields that we're talking about. And uh, particularly in this time of, you know, this huge data mining issue and everything's really, you know, grabbing data at, at its hands. Um, so which methods proved helpful and in regards to this, um, the fact that we, it's more dealing with this local, local authority, for example, this idea of local is quite important. Is it um, research which is also with people in mind? Is it a more daughter to approach or is it a more technological one? And yeah. Can I just answer the, the, the initial part of it? So the research that we are looking to do as part of the associate being placement is really a very hands-on approach and looking at build schemes in the borough. So we are still developing the brief, but this is kind of the draft version of it. Looking at high density, tall residential buildings within the borough and the ones that have been built and have been occupied for at least five years. So we have a good spread of time and residence movement and looking at, not only looking at how it's used, but what type of units, what type of uh, demographics, how it's used, how it's serviced. And it's kind of the approach we're going to take is very much uh, interviews, residents, other stakeholders, the management companies, because there's lots of it to do with also a big part is management and the freehold and the leasehold issues that also play a part. So that's kind of the broad brief, and it's very much hands-on, and the reason we're doing that is also to make sure that it's very local, and the case studies, and it's not just a data from Canada or Hong Kong, because that's also a part of research that a colleague of mine carried out as part of a, another fellowship. They will definitely be used for comparison, because it's always good to know how other schemes have been dealt with. But the way we're planning to do is very much local. And just to um, talk about what other research is going on, I'd be interested to hear from, from everyone else, but um, when you look at the kind of research that a, uh, a council needs to commission, a lot of that will revolve around um, the evidence for its developing its local plan. Now that's something it needs to refresh every four or five years. Um, the cost of commissioning all the evidence for a local plan, 600, 700,000 pounds, 800,000 pounds possibly. Um, and um, each council is spending that every four or five years. It's a huge ask on their budgets. And they don't have the resources to do that in-house, a lot of that in-house. So they're going out to Savills, James Lang LaSalle, to ask um, consultants to churn out pretty much the same kind of evidence, but just for their area. Um, that costs a huge amount, and there are some models where councils even are forced to use this kind of black box uh, methodology where, where consultants will give them the results of the evidence that they need for their plan, but they won't give them the workings. So it's, it's almost like um, uh, being on some kind of subscription. You don't have to go back to that consultancy uh, if you want to change the answer or, or when you next come around to going back to your plan. So there's um, that risk of not having control over how you, um, how you uh, research, create evidence and learn from that process is, is really serious. And it's kind of absurd when councils next door to each other are commissioning exactly the same piece of research for, for issues that don't um, fit within borough boundaries. So, you know, housing markets, they work to completely different geographies. Why aren't we collaborating more on those kind of things? Why aren't we use, using the same data sets, but sharing data between authorities? Um, sharing data even between departments within councils doesn't go on enough. Yeah. Um, and just as one very small example of something incredibly humble, but I think, um, or not particularly, um, uh, you know, it's, it's not exactly big data, but I think, 
uh, shows the potential of um, working more laterally uh, in terms of data across the council is, um, I think it was Wandsworth did uh, use the data on all of the fly tipping incidents uh, that they'd had to clear up uh, over the last few years to identify all of the sites that they would build on for infill housing because they suddenly f found where all of the, you know, the, um, the kind of un the forgotten corners of estates were, you know, the unfilled um, gaps. And that then led them to, you know, be able to really quickly identify where they can build a lot of, mm. you know, small units very quickly. And that, that's the kind of thing that hopefully our associates will be doing. Um, but it's also why we're partnering with Future Cities Catapult, um, who, are, who are developing lots of really clever technology, um, but, uh, but want to see that applied with local authorities. And I think it's something that by being slightly independent, by being not assigned to any particular borough, you're allowed to see these kind of bigger picture connections. Okay, we haven't got very, very much time. So um, if you've got even a latent question, particularly if you're a young architect or a young spatial practitioner who doesn't know everything you need to know about whether or not you want to get involved in public practice, stick your hands up and ask questions. Good. Let me take maybe two or three so that there's less pressure on you and more time to answer a few more. So there's a gentleman there and then um, Oscar next to you. Can we take these two? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much, super interesting. Um, I had two questions. Uh, one was just following up on the last, um, on the last question. Uh, would, you, would you be kind of commissioning your own projects as well? I mean, research and design, is, is that something that you can do within this kind of position of slight independence? Uh, that's my first question. And the second would be, um, I'd just be curious to hear about any kind of obstacles that you encountered along the road of kind of developing such a structure, um, thinking about how it could be um, developed for, for other, other contexts, other countries, uh, etc. Super. Okay, so two for one there. And then can we just get one quick question from Oscar and let me see how we go with these three. Hi. Um, I just have one question, which is... Uh, to do with central government and Westminster, because we know post-war, the legitimacy for building houses was written right there in the manifesto for both, both parties. So whoever got in power had the mandate from the public to build. Um, and so I'm just wondering if, I know the public practice is a young enterprise, but what the ambition would be for maybe installing uh, an associate in Westminster and actually trying to influence national planning policy frameworks and, and stuff like that. That's my question. Always ambitious. Okay, good. <laughs> Who wants to take on? Uh, maybe I'll start with the obstacles. <laughs> so, um, lots of... I, I guess there's lots of obstacles always in terms of, I guess, just like the world of bureaucracy, but we always call it beautiful bureaucracy and find kind of creative solutions within that. So I guess one of the issues we've had really is around HR and working um, with, actual, with with the placement. So we, we have, you know, buy-in from, from officers or um, from chief execs or from councillors within local authorities saying, yeah, we think it's a really brilliant idea. We can't wait to have this person on board. Board, and then suddenly you hit the kind of HR department and you're working through a whole different um a whole different group of people who either use agency staff and then need to justify why they're using a different organisation and not using the agency staff that they have a contract with. And it, it's those sort of um, conversations that uh, we are also learning along the way and, and finding more and more interesting um, obstacles as we go. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of one of the sort of hurdles we've had to face in, in more recent times. Um, what, what obstacles do you face, yeah. Tom? Um, <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think... I haven't actually come up against that many obstacles or okay. substantial okay, ones yet, but I think, but I, think, <laughs> I, think, I think one thing that, I, that I, is clear is how the, which will be an issue is how this works outside London, yeah. where it's really urgent that that's kind of solved soonish. Mm. And yeah. I think, and, and, and partly because 
you know, as I was saying earlier, the, the fact that we can work as a, and share information as a group of 16 of us working quite closely, meeting up every other week, um, is so key to having us having the confidence to take risks and try things differently mm-hmm. in, in local authorities. That's I think that's really important, Tom, because um, that support structure that, that you're cherishing and, and enjoying at the moment if that wasn't there, then that would be an obstacle, no? Just mm. learning the language, as Finn said, to yeah, speak policy. Yeah, asking the obvious question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, on the question about central government, um, and also touching on research, uh, we actually had the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government asking for a placement. They didn't get their act together, so they are in time to <laughs> receive time. one. Um, but there's real interest there. We're also speaking to them about them supporting us to scale the programme up beyond London. Uh, as well as Homes England, who are a really important player in this field uh, recently, since become, moving from becoming the Homes and Communities Agency to Homes England. Mm-hmm. And there's some fantastic people working there. They've just appointed Dominic Campbell mm-hmm. from Future Gov as their Chief Digital Officer. So coming on to the research, like really interesting opportunities uh, on that front. Um, we're speaking to both Homes England and uh, MHCLG about research topics that they're interested in um, that we could align with our uh, with what our associates are working on um, so that the research itself can be a way of engaging with different levels of government. Um, I was speaking at the government's design conference uh, yesterday. Um, uh, kind of extraordinary that they're hosting something like a design it's conference funny. in the first place. Uh, you know, the last time government even said the word design was probably back in the days of CABE, and even then it wasn't them, it was CABE saying it. Um, so there is a shift, I think, going on uh, somewhere in MHCLG. You even even hear Theresa May saying government needs to get back in the business of building homes. And, I, you know, you can question exactly what she means by that. There is no doubt that um, uh, authorities are working, authorities that are delivering homes at the minute are doing it despite the system rather than because of it. But um, as the crisis deepens in around housing supply and the, the consensus builds around needing to diversify who builds homes nowadays, whether that's small builders, um, uh, private developers, house builders, uh, community groups or government, I think uh, public sector, local government, um, I think there'll be, um, the, there'll be opportunities uh, for, for more delivery. Um, it will just be a different kind, as we've spoken about. I think, yeah, I mean, let's, let's hope so. But it certainly seems like the different way you're working with economy and private and public sector together seems like it should be more sustainable than mm-hmm. perhaps the idealistic moments that we saw early in the 20th century. A couple more minutes then. I think there is one question at the back. And if anyone else has anything oh, burning, there's one here. OK, so one where the microphone is and then Rory at the front. And if anyone else is really burning up, then you have to make sure that I can see your hand. Have I got to stand up? Did you say? No, 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 you're fine. <clears throat> I have to admit, I can hardly hear some of the things, maybe because I'm a bit deaf, but I don't think I am. Suddenly I've been diagnosed as deaf. But I thought in Britain, there is virtually no public housing being built. I think the idea, it's a very attractive idea, public practice, but there isn't any public housing being built. It's all being built by housing associations who have very different agendas from those architects that the first speaker um, mentioned, including people like Neve Brown. In fact, he's one of the few self-effacing, brilliant architects that we've seen in Britain in many, many centuries, I would have thought, not just decades. So I'm wondering, maybe you could tell me where the, all this public housing that you're saying is being built, is being built, because um, I spent my life, my career building housing, very little of it, but only, I only built six flats for local authorities um, through my career, which started in the 60s and ended in around 2000. And um, I'm wondering where you're seeing, maybe you could tell me where all this housing is. Yeah. I mean, I think the idea of, taking the question of building housing back to local authorities is a very good idea, I think, if that's what you're doing. But I've yet to understand quite, maybe I should read your website and learn more. But um, it's certainly, where is it? It certainly anyway. seems like you're trying to do lots of things and housing is probably part of it. Shall I take Rory's yeah. question and then you can perhaps think about Yeah, but perhaps it also goes back to what we were saying before about why 
that previous model can't be brought back now. Um, I, I had a question. Uh, I guess it seems like the model is really good at taking people with different kinds of backgrounds, whether they're architects or landscape architects, urbanists, in, and in a way turning them into planners, uh, embedding them in planning. Um, I mean, what's striking about the history that you told, this potted history of, of public planning in, in Britain and the AA graduates, uh, and that peak that we see in the, in the 60s and 70s, is that they were in, in they were there were architects officers in these um, departments, not just um, I mean I, I say just reacting or just uh, working on local plans or or just, but there seems to be a certain pride here in like we don't mark up the drawing, you know, we we don't pick up the pen. Bureaucracy is beautiful. These are the tools that we change we use now to change things. So I guess my question is. Um, are you moving towards a, a point where people can pick up the pen or are you, are you developing a sort of different way of making impact uh, through the um, government agencies? I think they're related questions, don't you think? I think, um, you know, from, from the pen to other, other ways of working. I think, I think it's a kind of question of influence. Um, I think... At was sort of post-war, it was the influence was in the architect working as an architect um, in in government, and I think at this moment in time, the influence you have as working as a planner, and, and that's why we say planning in its broader sense, it is about kind of it being quite multidisciplinary, and for me, that is definitely that's always been the attraction for working as I do in what in sort of regeneration. So. I don't like being defined as an architect. I don't like being defined as a planner. I think it's much more kind of textured in that sense. So I think despite that, there are, you know, in Croydon, they've set up their own sort of in-house architecture practice called Common Ground, and they are looking at sort of designing within within the council and delivering their own housing. But I think um, the sort of level of influence you can have, perhaps I was working on one project before as a project architect and you know, being really, really specific about design details and now I'm overseeing you know, 40 of those type of projects and I, I still have my pen and I still sketch and I still kind of influence these drawings and this, the kind of scale of um, influence you have I think is, I think is larger mm. in this more multidisciplinary way and I think it's important for um, architects, planners, you know, built environment professionals generally to kind of not be so particular about defining their professions in a very specific way. And the more more collaborative it is, the more broader the agency is, and I feel like it becomes less combative. For sure. I mean, I think it was... Um well, speaking to several architects about public agency, and the problem is if you marginalise yourself so that your discipline is kind of perhaps specialised but narrow, then you marginalise yourself out of the question, out of the budget, certainly. Um, oh, out of the Grenfell Inquiry. Yeah. Finn, perhaps you could... Uh, t would you like to address this question of housing? Oh, we yeah, did time yeah. economics, I think we should probably address the question <laughs> of housing. <laughs> yeah, well, you can address it. But no, it's, it is being built. Uh, all of those images I showed at the beginning are all council-led housing schemes. They're not all social housing, um, but uh, all of them have more social housing than a privately-led uh, 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 version on the same site. Um, so I think if you look at... Uh, Hackney's pipeline, uh, it will be around 4,000 homes, I guess. Um, Harrow, definitely doing it um, over 2,000, mm. 2,500. Um, uh, Barking are actually building the most uh, at the minute. Uh, but it's not just in London. You've got 117 local authorities across the country who've set up new housing delivery vehicles in the last few years. It has been triggered by this shift in government funding. It's a totally new thing. A lot of people don't know about it. The first report, that 117 figure, only came out a few months ago because someone sort of was realizing they were popping up everywhere and did and the Royal Town Planning Institute did some research to, to count them all. Um, everyone's doing it in a different way. There are 27 different models for delivering uh, council-led housing now. Um, and everyone's kind of reinventing the wheel in different ways. Um, but it's a, re it's a really interesting 
interesting new phenomenon. Um, it, it, isn't, it isn't all affordable. It isn't all good quality. Um, certainly when you, when you go out, we go beyond London, um, but it's real. And I think it's a huge opportunity for us as, as architects and designers to, to influence it. Is there, is there any way of you making, sort of sketching out how that might work? I'm, I'm, I'm sort of conscious that we're in a school where design ambition's really high. Mm. And certainly when we look at the best examples from the 20th century, we look at the, the best designed examples. So how does this slightly more competitive people making it up as, as we're going, what do you think that does in terms of opportunities for design and creativity? It seems like there should be more if things are looser and, yeah. and combined with the private sector as opposed to if there's one mandate. Yeah, and, and I think um, where councils are building, they're, they're often um, employing small architecture practices to do the design, Croydon being an exception, um, where they've actually uh, built uh, or started to build their own in-house design team. But to be honest, they're also working with a really great stable of young practices mm -hmm. on, on a lot of their other sites. So um, I think practices in London now realize that some of the most enlightened clients they're gonna have uh, are gonna be public sector. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, regeneration, housing, um, planning teams. Um, the, yeah, I think, I think there isn't enough um, there isn't enough awareness of it yet. We're only seeing the beginning of that generation. They are under huge financial constraints. Um, uh, public practice is one way of getting involved, but uh, I think it will be something that we, we won't even be questioning in a few years' time. We'll see it a lot more. Yeah, and with the sorry, the increased pressure on, on on the question of design, I think we're seeing that in policy, whether it's the new London plan or whether it's the MPPF. There's definitely this focus on the importance of design in in housing, and therefore again, sort of questioning the fact that these skills don't exist um, enough in local authorities, and bringing that back. Do you have favourite models? I think if you look at the government's own statistics, which I did about three months ago, you'll find that whilst there's a lot of debate about what affordable housing really means, in fact, um, ever since the 80s when Margaret Thatcher introduced the right to buy, there's been a negative dropping number of housing for um, rent for people who can't afford to buy their house, yeah. it's been dropping ever since. But I think in the last year, there was actually a minus figure for so-called affordable housing. I don't think people really agree what affordable you mentioned yourself. I think there's a difficulty. So what you're doing is very brave, but I think you're dealing with a much bigger problem than you think. Because there's no culture of public housing, of course, a lot of council tenants feel it's a stigma to be, you know, we don't use the word council housing. It was, it was nice that someone used it this evening. Actually, it was a dirty word um, 10 years ago. You didn't say that. You said affordable housing. Affordable housing was the new word for council I think, um, Of course, it's a great difference. I think you're right. I mean, there, there are... find a bigger dimension, uh, you know, brave thoughts, Sorry, I have a generous question. I like the sign of this, and I think you're doing a nice thing, but you do remember it's a much bigger thing. Remember, it seems like, I'll give you one little clue. You, you say you showed a lot of nice housing, and it was all council housing. It wasn't. After about 1980, there was no public housing. Housing. Thank that's, you. That's uh, housing for social rent, I, so it is I, actually, yeah. it's, it's the same, it, it qualifies the same way. I completely take your point in terms of a uh, right to buy and in terms of intermediate housing. But, um, but, and you're right in terms of intermediate housing and affordable rent, which isn't affordable, but social rent is. And, and councils are the only people building social rent, as well as a few housing associations. I'm going to take Chair's prerogative because any conversation about housing in London will go on and probably deserves alcohol. Can I just take the last question from Sam? Yeah, uh, I, I wonder, do you have kind of favorite models? And so are there like particular uh, initiatives that different local authorities are taking or things that you would like them to do that you are kind of en encouraging 
or are you, you know is is that something that you'll 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 develop like a, a, approaches different approaches to yeah so just a, the role of planning more than just sort of matchmaking mm. like sort of encouraging ways of operating in, in some ways or, or how these skills can be deployed in the Dream longer plans, term perhaps i think actually working the gla regeneration team has been really important to both of us in terms of our um, the way it works as a body which actually generates its own research and sets themes and agendas for London and is kind of self-initiated and has definitely been um, personally has been a, a really important inspiration for me and also the kind of quality of people working there and, and also the kind of working with lots of different teams within the within the GLA whether it's the economics team whether it's the health team whether it's the housing team so that has you you know, I think for me personally has been a really interesting model and perhaps it's my, you know, the only experience of working in public sector and has definitely shaped the way we've sort of designed public practice. Do you want to say that? Um, only to say that um, from my brief spell in public sector, um, there's, there's a few of us that are in similar roles and it's a discussion we have, especially the ones who are the, the only designers working in in, in local authorities. Cool. Yeah. yeah, like how do, how do you, what's the first thing you do? How do you establish some sort of design culture? And, it's, and I think it, it will naturally be that some of us are in similar situations and it'll be more or less us sh sharing the best case scenario between, between us. And that, it might be that there's three or four ways of, of, of kind of building design capacity based on, you know, just where we end up, I think. Um, and yeah, I think some of us will be drawing more than others, for example. <laughs> you create any dream things that you want to see happen with public practice? Like, if you could imagine five years from now, what do you think they'll be doing? I think we've been having this conversation for a while. So one thing which we discussed this evening is not only wait until somebody's had three years of experience, but actually offer the opportunity for them to actually explore public, so public sector while they're still studying. So that gives them an opportunity to explore. Is this a path? Is this what I want to do? Because at the moment, it's really voluntary and it's hit and miss. So one thing we've been discussing this evening is, is there a possibility for a much structured approach so students have an opportunity? So that would be one. And the other thing we're discussing is, on the one hand, we're talking about placing architecture architects in planning departments. But it's also an opportunity for architects, planners in the in planning departments to have an opportunity to engage with the architectural practice outside. Because that gives an opportunity also for them to have different conversation than what they are used to. So those two things would be really my That pitch. is really exciting. I mean, the market dictates in some ways that, that you know, the best talent often goes to the highest played places outside of public sector. And, and so what you've created, I think, is a really intelligent way of bringing some of that in for a year, just for a year, come and do something that means something different to what you do in the private sector. But again, this opportunity of opening up to um, people who are wishing to perhaps explore where they might put themselves in a career sense, I know would be really welcome from students. So I hope that happens too. Um, look, I think the gentleman at the back is absolutely right. It's a huge and brave project that you're pursuing. But I might turn it to you for any closing words, if that's all right, to boot and thin. Yeah, do you want to say something? There you go first. Um, well, I, I'll start by, and maybe end by, answering a different answer to Sam's question. Um, so we don't necessarily come with an agenda, uh, and, and I think that's partly because there isn't really a culture uh, of what we're talking about there. Um, they might have been 40, 50 years ago. That's not the culture we're trying to go back to, to recreate. We want to form a new culture. That's what the cohort's about. Like Tom, Tom's doing that already. It's, it's growing on Slack as we speak, as each cohort speaks to each other, as each associate speaks to each other. Um, and the idea is that, you know, when we get cohort after cohort, um, year after year, I think, I think we may well end up coming with a, with a culture. I don't know where that's going yet. The only models I have um, for this, uh, I think, are attitudes to um, where design is designed, who design is designed for. Um, so going back to the artist placement group, although that was artists, um, design research unit, uh, although that was graphic designers. I think the closest is probably Cooper Cooperativa Verbundet's Architect Contour, uh, or CoF Architects in, in Sweden. Um, 
leading architects in the 1930s who all got together and, and worked completely anonymously on completely anonymous normal buildings like corner shops, factories, a few school buildings, some basic cheap housing. And it's that attitude that um, as architects and designers, um, we shouldn't just be serving the few people with the deepest pockets, but that we can, we can influence normality. Mm. Uh, and, and raising standards of normality for the better uh, rather than just concentrating on exceptions. I think that's the kind of culture we have, if anything, um, but I'll be interested to see where it goes. Wonderful. All right. Thank you so much to Pooja, Finn, Sri Priya and Tom. Thank you to you. Do you mind thanking the panel for me? Thank you.